Uh, hello, are you a George R. R. Martin or a Dan Brown? What do I mean by that? Well, in the world of novel writing and screenwriting, there are two schools, two strategies. There are some people who would just go to the computer. They will think of an idea, go to the computer and start writing their story as a novel or a screenplay. These are what we could call pantsers or discovery writers. Uh, Brandon Sanderson, one of the most prolific novelists of our time, says he has this distinction. He says there are discovery writers and there are outliners. The other term is there are pantsers and there are plotters. So wh where do you belong? Are you somebody who likes to uh, come up with extensive outlines on spreadsheets and maybe index cards on cork boards and then start to write the novel? Or are you a pantser? You would think of an idea, maybe a what-if situation. You have a few group of characters and you put them in and then you go to the computer and start typing. Which one are you? I think this is a really fascinating subject. And um, uh, But the, the, the theory that I like is the one that uh, George R. R. Martin has come up with uh, many years ago. He said there are two groups. There are gardeners and there are architects. Uh, gardeners are those who are pansers, right? They just, uh, every day they go and tend the garden. They go and uh, do their thing in the garden. And uh, sometimes it might be just 200 words. Sometimes it could be 2,000 words. Sometimes it could be 12,000 words like George Simenon used to do. And uh, then there are architects. Architects might spend four weeks or maybe nine months uh, outlining everything, coming up with details, st detailed sketches about their characters, and then they will write the first draft, the second draft, and so on. So I think learning which strategy works is an efficient way for us to evolve as apprentice novelists and screenwriters. So who belongs in this group called gardeners? Well, apart from George R. R. Martin, this group contains so many amazing novelists who are commercially successful as, as well as uh, who, those who get a lot of critical acclaim. Well, here's the list. I, I've been studying this group, these two groups for a long time. So here's the list. Um, these are the gardeners, uh, uh, which includes John Le Carre, Dennis Lehane, R.J. Ellery, Stephen King, Harlan Corbin, Gillian Flynn, Sidney Sheldon, Dean Coons, Isaac Asimov, one of the most prolific novelists of all time, and then uh, Ray Bradbury, again, highly prolific, William Gibson, Lee Child, Ian Rankin, Denise Minor, well done, Scotland, and then we have Clive Cusler, Tom Clancy, Joseph Bamba, Thomas Harris, Minette Walters, Elmo Leonard, Robert B. Parker, Michael Connolly, Stig Larson, Henning Mankell, uh, Cormac McCarthy, Michael Ondaatje, Sir V. S. Naipaul, Philip Roth, Khalid Husseini. And uh, in the world of um, screenwriting, again, most A-list screenwriters, most A-list screenwriters who are truly successful, they would outline extensively. But there are some exceptions, uh, especially uh, people like Quentin Tarantino, Joe Esther House, Charlie Kaufman, Aaron Sorkin, Robert Town, Woody Allen, uh, Alan Ball and Max Landis. Max Landis is one of my favourites. And um, although he's fallen out of favour recently, he has a YouTube channel. Go and have a look at his channel. He, he regularly talks about the writing process. Uh, and Alan Ball, interestingly, wrote uh, the screenplay for American Beauty as a gardener. I think he took a, He was working as a, scri a script writer on one of the sitcoms. And then during the night, he will write uh, American Beauty. And uh, of course, he went on to win uh, the best original screenplay Oscar at uh, in 1999. And that screenplay is a masterpiece. If you haven't read that screenplay, read it and then study the film. Uh, but but screenwriters generally tend to be uh, outliners. But 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 who are the outliners? Who are the, now? There are some amazing outliners who have gone on to achieve great success commercially and critically. Uh, this list include. Uh, John Grisham, of course, highly prolific, and Michael Crichton, Yon Nesbo, Linwood Barclay, C.J. Sansom. C.J. Sansom uses spreadsheets, interestingly. And we have Fred Forsyth, Evan Hunter, who also published under the name of Ed McBain, Dan Brown, Agatha Christie, uh, 
Joe Abercrombie, the great British uh, fantasy novelist. And then we have James Elroy, uh, Harold Robbins, James Patterson, Ken Follett, and, uh, and many, many others. So where do you belong? Uh, have, you, have you thought about these distinctions before? Someone who's brilliant at explaining this uh, strategy of pantsing is uh, Stephen King. Now, in his memoir on writing in many different places, he describes this whole strategy about how he works. I love the idea that he thinks of stories as uh, uh, gems or fossils in a quarry and uh, writing a novel is a way of excavating it. And uh, th that's an amazing one, uh, way of looking at it. Uh, and uh, in his novel Bag of Bones, interestingly, this one, he goes into a lot of detail. Interestingly, have you, have you read this novel? This is a great novel about what it's like, about the inner life of a novelist, especially the inner life of a blocked novelist. And I mean, we've seen many novelists trying to, who, who would have a novelist as a protagonist. Um, J.M. Cotsier has, has a great novel called Elizabeth Costello, again, looks at her life. And, and Philip Roth has done so done it so many times through uh, the Nathan Zuckerman character. But I and I really love this one. But this is about someone who was a, who was commercially successful, but he's been blocked because his wife has died. And um, and there's a passage here which describes uh, the life that most pantsers, novelists who use this strategy of discovery writing, how they live. And I just want to read this out. During my hike back down the lane to the house. I tried to think about nothing at all. My first editor used to say that 85% of what goes on in novelist head is none of his business, a sentiment I've never believed should be restricted to just writers. So-called higher thought is by and large highly overrated. When trouble comes and steps have to be taken, I find it's generally better to just stand aside and let the boys in the basement do their work. That's blue colour. That's blue collar labor down there, non-union guys with lots of muscles and tattoos. Instinct is their speciality and they refer to problems upstairs for actual cogitation only as a last resort. I love the idea of boys in the basement doing their thing. And, and also this, this great phrase, instinct is their speciality. Stephen King is a brilliantly instinctive novelist, a great storyteller who can just go go to the computer and just get on with it. Of course, not all of his novels are good. And even within the good novels, there are great passages where he is just rambling. But he's still a great storyteller, especially from this group called Pantsers or Discovery Writers. And I, I recommend, of course, if you're an apprentice novelist, you should already have a copy of On Writing anyway, his memoir. Uh, but on top of that, I recommend you read this novel because it is good about the, the inner life of, of, of a novelist. And uh, when it comes to outliners, uh, the person who's brilliant at explaining that process is, is another genre novelist, and that's uh, Jeffrey Deaver. Uh, the crime uh, novel, the, the detective, he's famous for those detective uh, series featuring Lincoln Rhyme. And uh, there's, a, there's a great um, video on YouTube where he talks about his whole process. He takes up to nine months to outline one of his Lincoln Rhyme novels. And then he will write the first draft and the second draft and so on. Uh, that, I'm going to link that. I'm going to put a link to that video in the description below. But um, so I you know, if, if you're curious, I'm curious about the process that different novelists use because success leaves clues, say Stoney Robbins. Now, what follows this is a talk that Monica and I had in a car. And what was happening was that during the summer of 2018, uh, I had just won a playwriting competition, a national playwriting competition in England, and Taylor Swift's dog was commissioned and we were going around the country promoting this play. And Monica is uh, is an online marketing consultant. So she was uh, driving me around and we were having a lot of fun talking about it. And we used to go through so many of the beautiful countryside in Hertfordshire, Buckinghamshire, Wiltshire and other places. The play, interestingly, had performances in London, Cheltenham and Buxton. And what happened was uh, we were talking about the writing, but we used to have a lot of talks about the process of creativity because she's also a writer. And uh, what happened was we started talking about the creative process and she said, you know, let's film it. 
So that's what happened. So what follows is, is, is a very organic chat that you, I'm sure you have in your car. And, um, and uh, we had a lot, Monica and I had lots of inspiring moments in cars and hotels while we were traveling, having all these discussions. So th this is that discussion. I hope you find it really useful because I'm sure with your own fellow writers, you would have these conversations anyway. Uh, and uh, here it is. The, are you a George R. R. Martin or a Dan Brown? Who are you? Are you a gardener or an architect? I am Samuel Durham and uh, I'm the playwright behind Taylor Swift's Dog. It's a play that just toured England. It had performances in Cheltenham, Buxton in Derbyshire and London. And uh, the question that I want to ask you, all you storytellers out there, screenwriters, novelists and playwrights, is that are you, do you plan a lot before you write your first draft or do you just go to the computer or, the, or a notepad and just start writing your first draft? Because I'm asking these questions because I put this out there to one of my Facebook groups. I belong to quite a few writing groups on Facebook. And, and I think it's a really interesting question because it has divided the members in many of those groups. Because some members, they are gardeners. What they do is that they go to the page and they just start writing. They start writing the story and there are architects. And architects are people who have to come up with detailed outlines of the whole story and then they have to uh, come up with a, you know, explanation for each scene and then they'll write the first draft. Now, this observation goes back to something that George R. R. Martin said. George R. R. Martin, famous for Game of Thrones and many other novels, and he said that he's a gardener. So he has to, he doesn't plan ahead. And one of the reasons why his novels take many years to finish, not to read, but for him to write, is that uh, he's a gardener. And uh, Stephen King falls in that category, Dean Koons, Isaac Asimov, and many others. But on the other category of architects, you have uh, novelists like Dan Brown, uh, John Grisham, Michael Crichton, uh, Jeffrey Deaver, Agatha Christie. Agatha Christie, interestingly, uh, has series of notebooks that you can uh, read where she has shown exactly how she plans her novels and then she writes the first draft. So the question that I wanted to put it out to all the writers out there is that where do you belong? I think knowing your own preference is a good way to progress and also to fast track your apprenticeship because in the early stages of my apprenticeship I used to be a gardener. So I would just go get up in the morning and just start writing. And I got two abandoned novels as a result because uh, I wrote a novel called um, Georgia Glass. And it's about a woman who becomes famous so quickly and she fades and becomes a um, Miss Havisham type of figure. Miss Havisham is an important character in Great Expectations, Great Expectations. And I wanted to do a modern day version of that. And what happened was that I wrote about 30,000 pages and I, couldn't, I didn't know what to, where to go. And then I wrote another novel called The Great Sea Change, which is all about immigration in Britain. Again, I just went to the computer, started typing, and I think after about 42,000 words, I just didn't know where to go. And the lesson I learned from there is that I, I am better at being an architect because I used to get so nervous before a session thinking, I don't know what to write, being a gardener. But being an architect is that I map out every single chapter, every single G, a scene, so I know exactly what's going to happen. Then I write the novel. So if I don't feel like writing chapter three, I could write chapter 15 and I can then put them all together. It's in some ways, this is the way a film is made. Um, they don't always show, uh, the films are not always shot in that chronological order. So, uh, because right here with me is Monica. She also hey, writes everyone. a lot of stuff uh, for her entrepreneurs and business yeah. owners. And uh, Monica writes every day. She writes a lot of blog posts and other articles. Yeah. So Monica, are you a gardener or an architect? I think it's a really good question. I think it really depends, for me anyway, it depends on what I'm actually writing. So if I'm writing um, a blog post on a particularly 
you say a technical subject or what have you, I'd need to structure the, the post out. But if I'm writing about something creative, like maybe I'm talking about Salmon Talks and the way that Salmon and I work together, then I can be quite creative and I can be a gardener. So I think it really varies. Do you think it can, you do you think you can be a bit of both types? What do you oh, think, Samuel? That, that's an excellent point because somebody in one of my Facebook asked, I mean, I mean, is, is it going? Does it mean some one the gardener is superior to the architect? Mm. No. The the thing is, I think the best writers they embody both qualities. Okay. So there's a lot of planning. Sure. But when I write my first draft, there's a lot of lot of the gardener in me because I don't know everything that's going to happen within yeah. a scene. So you have to embrace the gardener in you, and all those gardeners should become better at planning right. because it that removes a lot of anxiety. Yeah. And also, the thing about gardeners is that. I know a lot of gardeners who write novels, but they don't end up finishing many things no. because they don't because they just go on and on. I've written, I've read yeah. stuff written by gardeners, and they can write good prose. Yeah. But as a whole, or as a whole in a chapter, yeah. they don't really go anywhere no. because they themselves don't know anywhere. It's a bit like reading a, a Stephen King yeah, novel. So it's, it's really important to then have that balance there. Yeah. And and, and so if you're more of a gardener. Can you sort of bring more structure into your writing? And yes. if you're more of an architect, can you bring more creativity into your writing, I guess? Absolutely. I mean, if you read a Stephen King novel, uh, a bad Stephen King novel, he's just rambling yeah. because he's a gardener. He's just going to his computer okay. and just typing. Yeah. And it gets really tedious. And then, uh, I mean, even a novel like Under the Dome uh, yeah. uh, gets tedious because he doesn't know where he's going but some Stephen King fans say they love that right. but I don't like it thing I love about John, uh, John Grisham or Dan Brown is that I know every single chapter every single scene has a reason to be there because they taught yeah. a lot about it and I thought with your, journal, uh, with yeah. your articles yeah. if you just ramble on about anything yeah. right it the reader is going to get bored no. There's, when I read your journal articles, I know there is a, a purpose there. and structure. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, I probably am more of an architect than I am a gardener, but um, there are times when I really enjoy writing and when I'm, I think I'm better, I think that's when I'm more of a gardener, being more creative and just writing. But I think most things need structure because without structure, how will you know that you've covered all the points that you know, you're giving to your audience? You know? yeah, interesting that we're doing this talk in a car because one of the famous quotes in writing comes from E.L. Doctorow, the, the novelist behind uh, great novelist, novels like Ragtime. And he said that um, writing a novel is like driving in the dark uh, with your lights on, but you only know as far as where oh, the lights so are much. illuminating, right? Uh, so you just get into a car and you start driving in yeah. on a dark street yeah. and you're just driving. But I don't really like that because... No. Uh, I don't feel confident because yeah. you can't drive fast yeah. because when you're, you're on a dark street and everything is dark you can only go slowly sure. but having an outline means that I can go really fast yes. so I could spend four weeks outlining yeah. but with my screenplays I can write the first draft in three days right gosh right and right. Uh, the, the I wrote Taylor Swift's dra uh, Taylor Swift's dog the first draft yeah. in I think three evenings right Okay, uh, 68 well, pages in okay. three evenings that went on to win a major competition but I spent over That's three a, months oh, I spent over pages. three months wow. planning yeah. and I spent nearly a year researching all the details with publishing yeah. I, I talked to a lot of uh, people who work in publishing so when I say I wrote it in three evenings yeah. or four evenings I, that's just the first draft but yeah. a lot of work went into it I because so. I'm an architect so yeah. I did a lot of talk discussions watched a lot of videos yeah. uh, listened to a lot of uh, YouTube interviews and, and I think the research is so underrated isn't yes. it because the, the amount of research that you have to do to produce a really good article is is extensive really and actually if the research is if the research is done well and, and done in a methodical fashion you can actually reach some really good golden nuggets that you can then pass on to your audience, probably much like you did with Taylor Swift's dog. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so the lesson that I could pass on to you is that embrace both techniques, you know, the, the gardener yes. and the architect. It's Definitely. only by trial and error you're going to find out exactly what's the best uh, strategy for you. Yeah. And, you know, don't just say, oh, I'm a gardener. I'm just going to stick to being a gardener. And it's the same as saying... Um, uh, you know, I, I only vote. I'm a Conservative Party supporter. I'm only going to vote Conservative Party all the do. time. Some people do. Don't be like that, you know, because you 
as an artist, you need to be flexible. Um, and you need to grow. Yeah, you need, you, to grow. you need to grow. So don't just say, oh, I don't do that. It's a yeah. bit like somebody saying, oh, I just prefer text. Yeah. I don't do phone calls. No. But what I'm su suggesting is try everything. Yeah. Skype, everything, whatever. Well, I think you grow as a writer if you can do both. Because yeah. you may find that you're, you may think you're a gardener and then you suddenly start doing the architect stuff and all of a sudden you realise, oh my gosh, I'm actually a better writer when I actually structure my work better, you know? And likewise with the creativity as well, you know? Absolutely. So uh, the, the three lessons that I would pass to you is that experiment in the early stages of your apprenticeship, experiment, right? Uh, do maybe try and write a novel without any plan like gardeners like Lee Child and Stephen King and at the same time uh, Then put that away See if you can finish that novel. Don't forget a good novel uh, Should be about 90,000 words if it's a YA it should be between 60 and 80,000 words uh, So try and finish that novel at least the first draft but then try and write the novel as an architect come up with detailed plans and see we, see where you are being fluent and successful the key thing is to finish projects if you yeah. can finish projects using whatever methods that suits you do that that's the first thing and the second thing is whatever method you pick be consistent yeah being consistent and consistent is really important that means writing every day even yeah. if you can't write it every day write every other day or at least two or three times a week I mean you write every day right yeah, yeah. I do I write every day and that and that helps me develop as a writer and to be more consistent with the fact that I can complete words within a set number of time so I think that's really important consistency is a great a great a great um, um, sorry one second <laughs> driving at the same time um, consistency is a great one um, to to follow because and I liked the idea Samuel that you mentioned of actually comparing the two you know to actually do the do the gardener version first and then write the same thing but with an with a more structured approach and just checking which which of those works for you you know yeah and the third and most important point you must you must love the process right uh, monica and i keep talking about the importance of loving the process you got to love the act of writing because if you if you don't like Definitely. the act of writing you're not going to enjoy being a gardener or an architect no. so that you must have fun with it and if you have fun with it you'll finish the your projects and that will, that will be good for your self-esteem Brian Tracy says that the key to happiness is task completion I would go further and say yeah. that when you start projects and you finish them it feels good like right, even so. if they even yeah. if they're terrible even if they get rejected yeah. by every agent uh, the main thing is you finish and you move on uh, on the even one of my birthdays I found out I, I got about 32 novels in various stages of completion yeah. But so that's when I started to realize that I'm uh, terrible at finishing things. Yes. So I started to finish things. So that's the sure. third thing. Enjoy your process. So on that note, uh, yeah. experiment. And anyway, happy gardening or yeah. happy being an architect. Take this, care, guys. Thank you for watching us. Bye. See you soon. So do you know who you are yet? Are you a gardener or an architect? Are you a, are you a plotter or a pantser? Um, the thing, the great thing about the arts is that there are no set rules. You can do whatever you want. So do experiment and then once you know what works for you, stick to that. Make that into a routine. That's what I would say. That's what's worked for me. And uh, if you like content like this, do please consider subscribing. If you're already a subscriber, thank you so much. Thanks for your support. And uh, share the love by sharing the video. You might be helping other novelists and screenwriters and playwrights who might be interested in all these different techniques that we used to get our stories out into the world. So until the next time, thank you for watching and bye.